Okay. Okay. So, well, great. Um, so what we wanted to talk about today, or what I wanted to present on is the Open AI, which is um, a company out of, I guess, the Bay Area somewhere. They used to be a nonprofit, but then I believe now they're actually for profit, but I'm not sure. Um, but they run a variety of different AI based systems. Uh, and specifically, the ones I've been playing around with are the GPT-3 system, um, which also then supports another system they call their codex system. Both of them run, run off of the same model, though. Um, so you may have seen this in the press. They released the GPT-3 model maybe 16, 18 months ago. Um, for beta testing for people to start playing with it. Um, and a lot of people had it do very interesting things. It's a language model. Um, so it's not actually intelligent, but it gives the appearance of being intelligent. Um, so it can write essays. People have used it to write books, like short stories. People have used it to write music. Um, and it's a language model uh, with billions of points of data in it. So pretty much they scraped all of Wikipedia, they scraped all kinds of different resources to build what at the time I think was the world's biggest language model. Um, and it does some pretty interesting things. Um, it works through a, a several different systems um, so what I will share on my screen is their web portal type system. So now you should see that. Um, so you can log into what they call their playground. Once you get beta access, you have to apply to get beta access um, and tell them what you want to do with it. And then a couple of weeks later, you'll hear back from them. Um, sometimes it's a little faster. So first, I'm just going to talk about the GPT-3 um, uses of it, and then I'll talk about Codex, which is their newest kind of variation on it. Um, so what GPT-3 does is, um, again, it's a language model, so it can do things like answer questions. It can... Um, do all kinds of things. Here, I'll show on this other tab. They have examples of things that people have built with it that you can actually then play around with. Um, so you can use it for chatbots, which is a pretty common application of it. Um, you can actually do translations from French to English and back again. Um, they have one that someone did where they use the language model to summarize things for a second grader. So you can use it to summarize things down to a lower language level um, for kids. Uh, but you can also do things like parse unstructured data. Um, so as you can see, they have quite a few different ways that people are finding to use what is essentially just a very, very big language model. I first got started playing with it for a chatbot idea I've been playing around with for a while. Um, and my chatbot could only answer questions that I told it to, what the question would be and what the answer would be, or at least some percentage chance of what the answer would be. Um, so then I was playing with this to see if it could answer things that my chatbot couldn't answer on its own just to see how it worked. Um, so they have an API interface as well. Um, it's pretty easy to use. Um, it works based on you prompt it. So you prompt the system um, and then you can ask it questions. So I'll show you kind of an example of how this works. Um, that might make more sense. We can come back then and look at some of the things that people are doing with it. Um, so as I said, it's a prompt based system. So you have to have something to prompt it um, to kind of get it set for what you're doing. 
So these are some prompts that I found if someone had put on a website. So for example, if I take a couple of these prompts to get it started. So this tells it uh, basically that we'll be asking it questions and it will be giving us answers of about this level of detail. Um, so you can have it give really short answers, like five word answers, or you can ask it to give longer, more detailed answers. And so this prompt is to set up to help it learn what types of responses it should be giving to the questions that you ask. Along the side here, you'll see that there are some settings and these are the same that you set within the API. So if you have the API, you just put it into the code. For example, what engine you want to use. Um, there are a variety of engines and DaVinci is their biggest one. It's the one that is built on their largest data set. Um, it also is the one that takes the computer the most power to run. Um, and I'll talk about the cost of all this at some point later too. So you tell it what engine you want. You can tell it this length of response that you're looking for. So I'll move that up to let's say maximum length of 250 or so. Um, I won't get into what the temperature and the frequency penalty and stuff is, but these are just different settings to fine tune um, how much creativity it uses, how much redundancy in language. Um, so if you, you can think of temperature as creativity. So the higher the creativity, then um, the more it can go further beyond just trying to find what the answer is. Uh, once you play with it, that probably makes more sense. So if we go ahead and we run the prompt and then we can write a new question. Um, so does anyone have a question that they would like to ask? What is COVID-19? Mm -hmm. I wonder how recently it's trained. So let's see what it has to say. So then we hit submit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I broke it. <laughs> uh, that's pretty funny. So yeah, it answered our question, um, but in a completely wrong way. Uh, COVID-19 is a TV <laughs> channel. Um, so yeah, let's try a different question. Um, I was trying to think of something recent that it has a, has a chance to train yeah. on. So I don't know how much COVID-19 is in Wikipedia yet. I'm guessing there's probably a lot of it. Um, so I'll go with how do electric cars work? Let's see what it says, since that's John's research topic. Why don't we type it wrong too? Like work. <laughs> How do cars work? Okay. Yeah, I'm not why sure why it's giving all those other faster? questions either. Yeah. Um, it could be um, something I mean, in my settings that I'm right? yeah. played with. Oh, is that Maybe right? it's yeah. trying to always answer three questions. Uh, if yeah. you give it one, it just gives you its own question. Yeah. Yeah, that could be it too. Yeah, my prompts might be misleading at some. So let's see what happens. We can let's just take away those prompts and just like, give. Uh, what is love? <laughs> there's so many things that, yeah, not just the song, you know. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh. Oh. Oh, that's very sweet. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, they smile when you <laughs> we can't we, we can load out a few points for <laughs> so as you can see it um again it's a language model so it's not really answering the question what is love it's looking at a corpus of billions of things that have written been written about love and how they relate to each other. And it's trying to pull together what it thinks would be a response to that question based on solely what other people have written about love. Um, 
so you can get fairly specific or you can have it make things up like this. Um, there was an interesting one that was going around on Twitter for a while when it, someone had asked it in the right way, um, are you intelligent? And its answer was pretty clever in how it described um, its intelligence and it kind of described it as I'm intelligent, but not like you think of intelligence as a human, would be my summary of how it described its own intelligence. Um, but again, it doesn't actually answer the question of what is intelligence. It just looks based on thousands of other things that have been written, what would be the correct combinations of words to answer that question. So as I said, you okay, can so do lots of things with this. Um, it's Q and A is just one example. Pardon, John? Try to break one more thing. So it's yeah. obviously trained off of what's on the web, which isn't always correct. So what if we ask it a question that's a conspiracy theory or something, like you know something that's been floating around uh, that's total nonsense, but it's just been proliferated like a lot like does evermectin or that that weird whatever that drug is does that talk cure COVID-19 or something like that you know um, yeah this is something a little older that would have been had more training yeah, to that's done. Uh, um, does the government control the weather <laughs> oh yeah there you go <laughs> just some some dumb conspiracy theory you know like and see if it picks up on it question, but no. But no. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sorry. She's <laughs> not entirely. I like that it out. threw it in and it's like, just because I know you were thinking about it, it also doesn't control corporations. <laughs> yeah, but the government does seed weather. So like they put things in the atmosphere to get it to rain. But say something that is a common, you know, misunderstood thing. But is, is climate change real? You know, there's tons of misinformation about that. Yeah. It's probably going to say, if it's based on Wikipedia, then it's probably going to be based on mostly true, because that's largely self-organized, you know, and people vet it pretty well. Okay, so it's not quite understanding. Oh, no, it is. There it is. It's interesting that it still asks the second question. Yeah, and that could be something in my settings. I don't know. It could be something too. It might remember things I've asked in the past or who knows. Um, interesting. But yeah, it's pretty amazing when you think that I mean, it's doing a pretty decent job. Like when I put it into my chat bot, because in the chat bot, I would have people ask things that I wasn't prepared to answer. And so this is a way of having a API tool where you can call data in from the outside. It does make some resemblance of sets um, rather than just saying that's an unknown. Uh, so you could use it in that type of way. Again, the API calls are pretty easy to do. Um, and it's pretty easy to integrate uh, in, in Python. It, I think everything is in Python with it. I don't believe um, there's any Java tools or anything that can be used with it at this time. Um, so let's take a look at another way that people, so that was factual answering, I guess would be the way to say it. Um, what was the one where you could tell it, you know, like write a for loop in Python and it would write the code for you? What yeah, that's that what I'm going to show next. That's where the codex oh, okay. system. Um, so this is, I'm, for starting, I was just going to focus on the um, natural language aspects of it. Can I ask it like a cultural thing? Sure. Like a, like a, what's like a movie trivia? What's, what's the answer to life, the universe, and everything? Oh, it's, uh, 
you know, something like that, that, that if you know enough about pop culture, you'll know that there's just a one answer, but it's probably going to write back like a giant paragraph. So what is it? What's life, the answer to life? life? Life, the universe, and everything. Uh, yeah. My kids just read those books. It should be 42, of course. There you go. Oh, nice. wow. So it does know some pop culture. Okay. Ryan, can I ask and a I'll question? Of course. Um, so how worried should I be when students use this to write short, short essays on their exams? <laughs> <laughs> Um, at this point, not worried because you have to apply to have access to it. So most students wouldn't have access to it. Um, but of course, I, they're just one model. There are several other groups that are making open source models of the same size. Um, I've been following the write ups on it just out of curiosity. It costs them right around $120,000 to build the model in terms of that's their electric bill, basically. I mean, that doesn't include the hardware, but that was how much um, it took like three and a half months of training the data um, to create the model. And their electric bill was outrageous, which I thought was really interesting. Um, so there are some environmental concerns about how many of these big models do we really want to train? Because as they get bigger, they'll drain more and more energy resources. Um, so at this point, though, as I said, it is a closed off system. You have to apply to get beta access to it. Um, though my guess is at some point, they will start opening it up more. Right now, there's researchers using it. There are some companies that are using it for different backend tools. Um, and then, as I said, there are a number of other open source groups trying to build a similar model because they don't like the idea that open AI is controlling this model. Um, just to give you an idea kind of how the pricing works on it. So with the beta for the Da Vinci engine, how they did it was, um, they gave me a, like a line of credit and you spend based on tokens. And so, so far, like all my playing, um, like you can see, I got access like at the end of August, um, I played around a lot on September 3rd with this particular engine. Um, and I've only spent like $5.90 of my $18. Um, oh, which I guess expires in December, so I should start playing more. But it's actually based on how much data you send to it. So how long these prompts are, and then how long their responses are. And every character counts as like 0 0.021 of a token or something like that. And so it adds up how much you're using of their system. So you can tell they're definitely building it for some future application where you'll be able to pay to have access to it. At which point, then I think we do have to worry about how students will use tools like these. Um, to answer questions, to write essays for them. Uh, and if you do a search on the internet for GPT-3 um, in essays, there's lots of examples of essays it's written. Some of them you'll kind of laugh at. You're like, oh, a computer definitely wrote that. But then there was a whole series that someone did of having it write short news articles. And those were actually good enough probably to get published, if not in newspapers, definitely on news websites. Um, so it could take data and uh, turn it into news stories very effectively. Uh, and that was one of the reasons that the open AI group didn't initially release it as an open piece as well 
was they said they had concerns for how it could be used to manipulate um, manipulate people, manipulate news, and so forth. So I'll just click on a chat and let's see. I can open in the playground. What can we help you with today? Um, let's see if something new is in there. <laughs> ah, so it's not up to date because the election was on Sunday. Um, what if you say who won the German election yesterday? Just okay. to give it, because it doesn't know based on your first one what time. Okay. Oh. So now that's we're getting. Correct. I don't know. <laughs> I think that might be correct. What if we yeah. say like who won the the yeah. like who won the Yankees game yesterday or something like really current? Yeah. Does anyone know the correct answer, or does someone want to look up to make sure the Yankees did play? <laughs> yeah. No, they definitely did. I guess I should tell baseball. Uh, Is that certainly true? Lost. I, don't, uh, I don't know. I wasn't. My wife likes the Yankees, but I don't pay attention. So I'm not sure if that's correct. But um, not old. That's old. Yeah. Yeah. The last time they played the Mariners was like I think a month ago or something. Like that. Like, what is the date today? Yeah. What is the date today? Like, oh, what is today's date? Yeah. yeah. I mean, that should be pretty. I know that could be basic. So let's go ahead and ask it. Are you. <laughs> See what it says. <laughs> Deceptive answer. Yeah. I'm always learning. <laughs> Oh yeah. No. The thing is, like, there's so many really, there's really good chatbots for all these, you know, special use cases for different things. I mean, and this one, I guess, is trying to be just like a general one, which I guess is exponentially harder because so many types of questions you could ask it. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's kind of the problem with chatbots is. They're only trained on a certain corpus of questions. And so if they don't if you ask, it? ask something off the wall, a chatbot will get thrown quickly. Oh, sorry. Someone had an idea. What if you ask it, uh, how can you help me? I'm curious what it has is like the limit. What would you like to know? <laughs> so you didn't get into a loop there. I'm avoiding the question. Yeah. Okay, let's look at. Sorry. Like, which is better? Which is better, apples or oranges? Like, give. I want it to have an opinion. It's probably going to be like it depends. Oh, oh, we have an opinion. <laughs> well, it says we have an opinion. Uh, That's people... the opinion of, of the people. Yeah. Oh, we could get very controversial. Cite your source. Where is this information coming from? <laughs> we could get super controversial very quickly with that type of thing. Yeah. But, okay. Anyway, that's interesting. Um, so let's look at one more natural language, and then I'll move to the one of the coding ones. Because that's what I've been playing with most recently, and it just got released. Um, uh, 
I haven't done this one before, a science book, should, book list. Let's see what that is. Usually they show you an example at the top. Uh, I wonder if we do something like, um, See what happens if I do this. Oh, yeah, we don't want that then. How to win friends and people. I mean, that's yeah, that's about as famous a self help book as you can get. Um, oh, because we only trained it to give one. That must be why it only oh. gives one. So let's do this. Let's do. Um, so that's really well. Robot diaries. Um body problem. Okay, now let's see what happens. Unsafe content. Uh oh. Well, you do have murder in there. <laughs> okay, so we'll take that one out. What was another one someone said? Ender's game. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, it's just tweet. Yeah, I don't know how we go from there. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what this one is supposed to do for us. So maybe that's not a good example. OK, well, let's talk about the coding one then. Um, so the newest one they released, they called their codex tool. And if you give it prompts, then it will write code for you. Um, in their video introduction that I saw, so they released this about three weeks ago, um, and they did a video introduction. It said that they could do other languages too, but I've really only played with uh, Python. Um, but we can try some things with that. So one thing I did, so I went to one of John's websites where he has examples of coding projects for his students. Um, and I use that to get ideas for what I could ask it to do. So let's see. So this says, write a function called is happy number and which takes a possibly negative integer and returns true if it's happy and false otherwise. Test with one, two, three. And John can tell what happy numbers are if people are curious. But. I mean, but does it, I'm really curious if it knows what that means, though. So. Wow, it actually does know. Uh, but it actually didn't write the function, did it? Um, no, it just told me what it is. OK. Oh, that's interesting. Um, um, I think they scraped a bunch of different tools. Like what they said, who was saying Wikipedia. Um, Let's try a different one and see what it says. Yeah, I'm not sure, but it's right. Uh, Thank you. Back to here. Oh, I wonder if I have to do the like this. Oh. Okay. Oh, I have the response leak set too low. Let me. I limited it to 60 characters, so that one. It... I mean, it's correct, but it has to write, OK, it has to write what is a happy number. Wow. It even modularizes it. That's really interesting. That it knows to write like helper functions. I don't know if it's correct, I'd have to look at it. But... Yeah, so what I've been playing with is using it um, yeah, let me do one more and then I'll sh show you what I've been doing. Um, 
Oh, I like this one. It's a good thing I teach R because no, you can't use this to write R code yet. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Well, this is probably picking up a solution though based on like where I got this problem from was the class at Carnegie Mellon, which is a Python oh. class. And I just took the, I took the prompt and wrote it for okay. R instead. So that solution is like available on their website. You can go see that exactly. It might be picking that up. So then I can take it and I can go over to JDoodle, for example, or the Python, run it, and it comes out to 14. So, yeah. Which it, So yeah, it did produce the right code for us. But what's interesting, um, what I've been playing around with it is to see in terms of how do you learn to write prompts that actually get you code that works versus code that doesn't work? Because it's not exactly natural language to say, write me a function which takes a non-negative integer one, two, three, and returns as some of the squares of each of its digits. Um, so how do we get trained to tell it what to do more clearly so it can do for us what we want it to do? But the implications are pretty big in terms of, if you think of getting started with writing code and how you break down problems for the system to write code. I'll go ahead and bring up another one. All right, guess what we can do? I've been wanting to do this, but let's see what happens um, if we tell it the right uh, Java script function for it. And see if it gives us JavaScript instead of Python. Python. Yeah, gives us Python again for some reason. Yeah, and I don't know that part. I have, that was the first time I tried to have it write something other than Python for it. Um, but in the video, they even have it do API calls. So they ask it to like access Twitter and bring something back and it writes the code to do that. Um, yeah. But it, it doesn't execute the code, it's just writing code. And it's writing code based off of its analysis of GitHub, which probably explains why it has a lot more Python than anything else, because its main source is GitHub from my understanding. Oh, uh, that makes a lot of sense. Um, can we ask it to do something interactive like write a function that returns the current price of Bitcoin. But then it's going to have to choose where to go to get that price and scrape it from the web and return it. Or choose to call some API that exists. Let's see what happens. Easy request. Oh man, it's getting complicated. Even as a sleep in there? Oh, I think it ran against my. Let's see what happens. I... I'm not going to do any single homework anymore. <laughs> oh, now this time. So I extended it, and this time it ran. So I don't know if this will run. Let's see if. I'm not sure if they have the right libraries and JDoodle or not. Yeah, it doesn't have the. Request library request in JDoodle. Library. Um, oh, but you I have it. I can run it over here. Um, yeah, yeah, but yeah. There we go. Forty-one thousand four hundred and eighty-eight. Works. See.
So even if you don't know if it's perfect, at least gives you a starting place, I guess. <laughs> Um, so yeah, that's all I really had intended to show. Um, I guess if anyone wants, I can, um, I don't know, I can find, try to figure out how to get more people access like to my beta version potentially. Um, so for now, the codex engine, so we're running over here on the right, you'll see it's DaVinci Codex, which is the coding one. They're currently not charging for calls to it, so you can run as many calls against it as you want. Um, which has been pretty fun to play around with. So I built a Django site where well, I could just show people it. I think it's up. I think my server's on it. Right So basically, it's a, like a chatbot where it asks you to give it instructions, and then it checks to see what code it writes. Um, let me see if I have it, my response here. I don't have it already written out. Um, but the idea is that it will check it I guess I can just write it real quick. Oh, write a function. So it asked me to, it gave me a problem, and then I tried to get it to write code for me. And then now it's doing a call to the API to get the code, and then it checked it against the JDoodle API. So I asked it to multiply something by four and then by four again and test the code with 32. Um, and it worked, so it says, excellent. The instructions I gave it led it to write good code. And then it gives another problem. So that's the type of stuff that you can do with a tool like this too, beyond just using it to write your own code. You can learn how to interact with the system more effectively, hopefully. Okay, um, well, that's all that I had. If anyone has questions or if anyone wants to take a closer look, um, you can also apply for API access, as I said, through their website um, or uh, not API access, beta access through their website. Um, I just put in that I wanted to do research on how students could use a tool like this. And in a week or two, they got back I got an email back saying I could have access. So it's not that hard to get. You just have to ask and have a somewhat plausible reason, I guess. Thank you, Thank you for okay. sharing. Oh, Thank not you. a problem. It's been fun to play with, I have to admit that. It's very entertaining to try to get it to throw errors and um, ask it funny questions. My kids have enjoyed it too, asking it funny questions. Uh -huh. <laughs> kids ask a lot of funny questions. So it's nice to have a second source of ideas for how to answer those. Uh -huh. Okay, you can probably stop the recording now, John, if you want. Um, yeah. And just to let people know I can pull up the schedule.